Hi, Year 10. Welcome to this week's episode of your English Literature Podcast. I'm talking to you today, you have Miss Beaumont, Mrs. Abdul Karim, and Miss Henley. And today we're talking to you about the poem Porphyria's Lover by Robert Browning. Um, it's really important that you have read the poem before listening to this podcast. So if you haven't, please pause this now um, and just read through it and get your first um, ideas or impressions of what might be happening. Um, but if you have already read the poem, let's get going. Okay, so we'll talk to you a little bit first about what we know about the poet, because it's really important to reference what we understand about context in our answers. Um, so what do we know about Robert Browning, the poet here? So he's a famous Victorian poet and he really supported women. Um, he could see in his society how women didn't have the power that I think he thought women deserved. And I think this is one of the ideas that he explores through his poem. Because it's important to remember, isn't it, in Victorian England, that women didn't have the rights and the power that they have today. Mm -hmm. Women didn't have the right to vote. Um, many women didn't have the right to do things like own property. Mm -hmm. So unlike today, it was very much that if you were a woman, you really relied on your father while you were younger and then your husband when you were older. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's quite interesting, the fact that this poem is, seems to be about power between men and women, and this power seems to be really, really violent. I mean, in this poem, we can see that it, there's a storm, there's the speaker who seems to be a man, a woman, Porphyria, comes in to um, the cottage that is is in the this stormy wilderness, and he talks about how beautiful she is, and then he seemingly without any kind of sadness or remorse just murders her mm -hmm. and for me the first thing that i thought when i read this poem is is this man does this man feel any emotion is he just a cold-blooded murderer is he insane i don't know there's lots of questions here um, so thinking about the way that language has been used um, should we have a look at porphyria as a character we can see that there's lots of quite positive words, I think, associated with her as a woman. Um, for example, the use of the word yellow to describe her hair. It's like she's shining like the sun. And as you mentioned before, she comes into the cottage and she stands out, he finds her beautiful. But at the same time, um, as you say, Robert Browning supported women. So it's as if he's made Porphyria the number one woman, let's say. She stands out, she's beautiful. She's like a cut above the rest in that sense. Even though at that time women didn't have any power, he's made her have power. He's given her a sense of power, let's say. And I think that can be shown when he says, I think it's line eight, that when, when she comes into this cottage, she transfers it from being a cheerless great and she blazes this place up, almost yeah. fills it with warmth. Fill, and he uses the word warm, and that's what we associate with her, not just beautiful, yeah. but as a character, warm um, and shining. And that's really in contrast with the outside. So the use of pathetic fallacy mm -hmm. to describe the weather, the fact that the start of the poem sets the scene as being rainy, there's the sullen winds, um, it's tearing the elm tops down, so it's tearing the trees down from spite. It's really aggressive, it's really angry outside. So we can see that the, 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 the difference that Porphyria makes, mm -hmm. it's almost like she takes all of this anger in nature and she removes it instantly the second she arrives. And I think one of the sad things about it is if you look at line 30, um, he says, that she's, she was come through the wind and rain. So she's come through all this difficulty into this cottage, but actually what she doesn't realize that within this cottage, there's more threat for her. So while she might feel that she's at ease now and she's more comfortable because she's safe against the, the harsh wind and uh, rain outside, actually what's going to happen to her now is going to be significantly worse for her. I think it's interesting if we start to look at the end of the poem when he he decides he seems to decide to kill her and then he says on line 38 
I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. I think that the tone there is really quite emotionless. Mm -hmm. There's no um, punctuation that suggests he's shouting or he's excited. He uses a full stop. So it's he's just saying it in a way that's quite matter of fact, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. Um, and then really confidently says, no pain felt she. I am quite sure she felt no pain. Well, how can he be sure that she felt no pain? He's not her. So I think that's quite interesting. We get a sense that either he doesn't care at all about the fact that he's killed her, or perhaps there's something a bit mentally unhinged about him, which means he's convinced himself he does understand how she must be feeling in that moment. You could link both of those two things that you just mentioned to the structure of the poem. So he's not actually, it, there's no stanza, it's a... Continuous, continuous stanza. stanza. Yeah. So there's no actual break. So could that suggest that he's, he's unbalanced in that sense? He, he, he's very continuous, he doesn't stop. And then you've got the last line, um, and yet God has not said a word. So could it be that he's not fearful of God, or he's maybe he's waiting to hear from God? Does he think he can hear God? Does he does he care about God? So there's because a question in there as well. Again, the Victorians were sort of famously very God fearing, or at least on the surface, outwardly would go to church mm -hmm. and would and and every Sunday and would give to charity if they were a respectable middle class Victorian, as Robert Browning was. Mm -hmm. um, but also the Victorians very. Um, famously had often had very secretive lives where mm. they would do things that that were perhaps illicit or illegal they would do things that society would frown upon they just wouldn't talk about it so there's a bit of a sense of secrecy maybe there as well as the fact that god hasn't said anything yeah. um and perhaps god would disapprove yeah i'm not sure maybe he wants to be worshipped by her maybe he feels like he he is deserving of being God because earlier on in the poem he says with with quite a lot of confidence actually he says that last I knew Porphyria worshipped me he doesn't doubt it there's no you know maybe she worships me maybe she doesn't maybe she loves me maybe she doesn't and it's quite interesting that he used the word worshipped here which I think links to his need to feel quite powerful um, against her so do you think then that uh, Robert Browning wanted his reader of this poem, he wanted him, them to feel kind of a sense of anger and disgust at this speaker? Is that the the reason perhaps that he wrote the poem is to make the reader feel angry that the men, the men in this society that he lived in have so much power and can use that and can murder a young woman either literally or yeah. metaphorically but and, no and, reason, no, yeah. and nobody says anything mm -hmm. not even god who's supposed to be watching over everybody yeah and he feels no remorse either does he, he doesn't there's no he guilt care. is there's there no, guilt. He no. Doesn't care about what he's done and again that could link to the fact that at that time in the victorian times women didn't have that power they didn't have a say so maybe he thought he could kill her and get away with it because it's nothing maybe in a sense he can, he can do that. Because even though he's killed her, he says, um, her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss, almost as though she's enjoyed the process. Yeah. Like she's, she's still beautiful and he's just propped her head up as before. Like nothing has changed. So yeah. he's killed her, but nothing really has changed. So, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that line just before that as well, in line 45, he opens her eyes. I warily opened her lids again. So he opens her eyes and he describes her eyes as laughing. Left mm. the blue eyes without a stain. Mm -hmm. Almost that, that idea that she, there's no stain in her eyes. It's maybe like he's trying to preserve her almost. Mm. That there's She's so pure and good. He doesn't want anyone else to have her or he yeah. doesn't want her to be ruined almost. Yeah. Again, there's a, a sense of He's almost possessing her there. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of sort of themes and ideas of power 
and desire and sexuality in this poem. For me, when I read it, the first poem I thought of that would, I thought would be a really strong link was Sonnet 29. Mm -hmm. Because in Sonnet 29, you've got um, a woman writing about her desire for a man. And in this poem, obviously, we've got a man's desire for a woman. And even though in this poem, obviously, it's much more violent, the desire, and there's a much more violent and aggressive outcome, there's still very similar feelings of it being almost very difficult to control and taking over and going against expectations in society. Are there any other poems that you think might be a good link for this one? I think perhaps um, The Farmer's Bride on the idea that women didn't have as much power um, as men in society at that time. I mean, The Farmer's Bride isn't quite as aggressive or as violent as Porfirio's lover. Um, and you could argue that, you know, she, she isn't killed by the man she sleeps up in the attic there's distance between them mm -hmm. um one of the similarities i thought was the reference to her beauty her eyes or her hair in particular um and they are both dramatic monologues as well because we we associate long hair obviously as being very feminine mm -hmm. it's a very womanly attribute and um, certainly in Victorian England, it was considered very modest to keep your hair certainly back, but usually covered as well, especially around strangers and people you don't know well. So the fact that um, there's this focus on hair, again, expresses the desire to see almost a hidden side of this woman, a side that respectable society doesn't get to see. Okay, so I think that's all we have time for. We hope this has been helpful in helping you to understand Porphyria's lover. Um, thank you for tuning in and make sure to join us next time for our next poem. But for now, goodbye. Bye.